Hello everybody and welcome to this video which is kindly sponsored by Squarespace. So today we're going to look at something a little bit different, what goes on behind the scenes on a Squarespace website. So this is the analytics feature and you can see here which parts of the site are the most visited. Unsurprisingly, considering I started the site mostly for naval photos, the naval photos bit is the most popular, the high seas fleet is the single most popular photo page, but there's also a fair number of you visiting who want to meet me or learn about the channel. So that's quite nice. But if you were developing your own website, obviously this would tell you which pages are the most popular and perhaps you can direct your efforts in that location. Alternatively, you can also look over here at the marketing section, specifically under SEO. So this is the search engine optimization. So you can see here how the site currently appears on Google search. Uh, I can add an additional couple of keywords down there if I want. And if I go up to the top, then it will allow me to see a checklist of things that and tips and suggestions on how to further optimize my SEO ranking to make the website more visible to people if that's what I wanted to do. And for your website, if you're running a business off of it, you may want to do that yourself. So useful features all. So if after all these little mini tutorials I've been doing, you think you could build a website for maybe ideally naval history purposes, but you never know, you might want to do it for some other reason, then head over to squarespace.com forward slash Drakenafel. You can get a free trial, and once you're ready, that little link will give you 10% off your first website or domain. So thanks once again to Squarespace for sponsoring the video, and on with the main show. Yeah, so we're, we've got Guadalcanal, the campaign's kicking off. What's the strategic situation for both sides in Guadalcanal? Because obviously prior to this, when we've had, um, you know, attacks on troop convoys, potential night actions and fleet battles. This has all been kind of a moving target that either side can afford to decline or accept at, the, at their will. Now there's a fixed element with the island of Guadalcanal. So, so where are both sides stacking up in terms of what they can actually do, what they can afford to do, what they're trying to do? Well, from the Japanese perspective, uh, even in the wake of having lost at Midway, they don't think that they're beaten. And in fact, the imperial military is still acting very, very aggressively. And what they do at this point is kick off a campaign in New Guinea, uh, land the South Seas Force at San Ananda, and begin advancing across uh, the Owen Stanley Mountains towards Port Moresby, which you can think of as the Battle of Coral Sea Part Two, the land of sequel. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what's going on on the Japanese side. But then, you know, our good buddy, uh, Ernie King, uh, in the wake of Midway, seizes the initiative with laudable haste and decides that, you know, we're going to we want to take the initiative. We want to be getting shaping this war to our ends, which means that we want to start finding some place to counterattack. And lo and behold, given the fact that the Japanese are building this air base on a place called uh, Guadalcanal, we don't get wind of that until about June, but very quickly we're like, no way are we going to let them advance down the Solomon Islands and potentially threaten the supply lines that are running to Australia. And so they throw together this operation called Watchtower, and away we go. Trent, anything you want to add on that? Yeah, the uh, you you're you're absolutely right. King is astute. He's looking for opportunities to try to seize the initiative. He's very concerned. Maybe is not the right word, but aware of the lines of communication between the West Coast of the United States and the Panama Canal, and then Australia and New Zealand, especially Australia. Uh, the Japanese in uh, advance through the Solomons threatens that, threatens some of the bases that have been established along that line of communication. And, and so he wants to prevent them from occupying and, and turning Wall Canal into, into a major base. I Also, if you look at uh, the, the plan that the United States Navy, which, you know, uh, Rear Admiral Richmond Kelly Turner has a lot of influence over as uh, head of the war plans section uh, back in uh, the Office of the Chief of Naval Operations in Washington. It's got three different tasks in it, right? So task one is to occupy uh, Guadalcanal, and then it, it, it anticipates an advance up the Solomons, a recapture of Rabaul. And what uh, King, I think, has in mind is sort of a, a, a flanking movement of the Japanese bases in the Central Pacific, primarily truck, uh, the, the beautiful anchorage in the, in the Central Carolina Islands. 
And uh, occupying Rabaul provides an opportunity to come at that Japanese defensive network from the south, which I think King has has in mind. Now, you know, the war is going to take uh, a very different shape than that concept. But if you look at the at the thinking at the time, I think that's part of part of what they have in mind. And one of the things that fascinated me when I started looking at the, the preparation for the Guadalcanal campaign is how fast they expect to be able to move. Right, so land the Marines on Guadalcanal, take the airfield, take the take the anchorage across the Sound at Tulagi, and then in a matter of weeks, replace the Marines with an Army Defense Battalion, uh, rehabilitate the Marine Division, and use them for the next forward leap. You know, so to advance through the Solomons, not dissimilarly from the way that the Japanese were advancing through the Dutch East Indies uh, during their initial uh, campaigns early in nineteen in nineteen forty two. But it's not going to work out that way. No, <laughs> no it's not. <laughs> right. So then, um, obviously, around the, the waters of Guadalcanal, and that later known as Iron Bottom Sound, for a, for a good reason, that they're fairly confined. Um, they're kind of at the tail end of both sides' bases, Espiritu Santo and Rabal, the forward bases. Um, there's obviously a lot more risk involved in putting forces into these very confined narrow waters with a lot of rocks and islands popping up here there and everywhere as compared to a, a big night action in the open sea so how much of a risk do the two navies perceive there to be in potential night actions off guadalcanal and what's their attitude towards accepting or mitigating these risks I think you're right to point out that uh, Iron Bottom Sound is really constricted. You know, I, I, I say it's about the size of a bathtub compared to, mm -hmm. you know, some of the battleship weapons that are being used here. The, uh, these battleships can fire a shell clear across the sound. So that is not the kind of environment that you want to put battleships in if you can avoid it. Um, the first battle that we're going to see, you know, Savo Island, I, th I think demonstrates, though, that the Japanese, at least in terms of their lighter combatants, are perfectly willing uh, to bring, you know, any manner of ships uh, down into these constricted waters. And they feel they feel very comfortable in this environment. Um, the one thing that Iron Bottom takes away, though, because of its smallness, is the ability to employ the long lance in its preferred mode, which is from extremely long ranges. Uh, I think the Japanese are going to be sort of surprised by that, that even they are not necessarily ready for uh, the very close encounters that are going to happen in this area, you know, over and over again. It's super dark all the time. You've often got cloud cover and, and storm systems moving through. Uh, so the visibility conditions are just wretched in a lot of these battles, uh, which means that their favorite weapon, the long lance, ends up getting uh, employed at ranges of 10,000 yards or less in most cases, which kind of negates its standoff abilities uh, as far as the Japanese are concerned. But, you know, this is where they got to fight and they're good at this sort of thing. So I don't think that they were uncomfortable about, about going into this theater at all. Trent. Yeah. The, uh, the point that you make about the visibility is really important. It's, it's extremely variable in large part because yeah. of uh, the storms that ensue there in different action reports. You can see, or at least tease out you know, the impact of these uh, rain squalls sometimes they're mistaken or these you know whether rain itself or or just the the clouds are are mistaken for islands you know ships sort of lose track of where exactly they are and that has an influence on on the battle because you know opposing ships or even friendly ships you know can pop up in ways that are that are unanticipated uh especially if if the formations are a little loose and a little distributed so that's a that's a major factor when we think about risk, the U.S. Navy had, you know, explored night combat, done a series of exercises through through the interwar period, and one of the things that recurs is how dangerous it is for a battleship to get into through close range action with with a lighter combatant like a destroyer, uh, because you know they see in the exercises uh, a lighter ship can at close range turn its weapons onto the bridge and the superstructure of the battleship and and even relatively small weapons potentially even anti-aircraft artillery is going to uh penetrate uh the light plating 
that is in the upper works of ships like that, uh, sever communication and electrical lines, make it more difficult to handle the ship effectively. And so, you know, risking battleships in narrow waters like this is something that the U.S. Navy is very hesitant to do. And I think even after Savo Island, hesitant to risk larger ships uh, because, you know, the, the effectiveness of the, of the Japanese in that initial battle was not anticipated. Uh, Turner, who was in charge of the amphibious force, did not expect the, the Japanese to seek a, a surface action at night. So he and his subordinates are caught very unprepared. Uh, and the battle, given some of the things that we've discussed already, you know, how powerful some of these weapons were and how effective they were at close ranges, you know, unfolds not unlike you might expect. You know, the Japanese get the drop on the Allied force, win uh, two quick victories. I, I like to separate them because there are two yeah. Allied forces that they fight, the sort of the Southern force and the Northern force. They win two quick victories, overwhelm uh, those forces in turn. And although the Japanese formation does not remain entirely cohesive, it remains cohesive enough to strike as a unit and then withdraw uh, without major loss. So it's yeah. uh, the, the South Pacific, U.S. South Pacific forces are sort of shocked at this ability. And it takes them a while to get to the point where they're willing to begin to risk waters or risk ships in the narrow waters off, off Guadalcanal again. So it's, it's, uh, months until the next you know, major surface action is fought. Yeah. The two things that really stand out for me about Savo Island are, first of all, just how ballsy uh, Admiral Mikawa was in initiating this battle. He knows that there are American carrier forces in the neighborhood, but within you know an hour or so of having received information that the Americans are landing, uh, he's put together a scratch force and he's, he's heading on down there. This is not the A-team that he is bringing to this fight. He is bringing one modern combatant, his flagship Chokai, uh, along with Cruiser Division 6, which are the six, uh, the four oldest heavy cruisers in the Japanese inventory. He's got an equally ancient pair of light cruisers and then this really old destroyer. So this is a pickup team, um, but he knows that his doctrine is is uniform and that all of those units understand what it is that they're supposed to be doing uh, in a night fight. He selects a very simple formation, a line ahead formation. He puts, you know, Chokai in the lead and is basically saying, follow the leader uh, and, and brings them successfully into the sound. And then the other thing that is so striking is even at the time that they have launched torpedoes against the Southern Allied force, they have already visually detected the Northern force at a range of, correct me if I'm wrong, Trent, it's something like 17 or 18,000 yards. It's absurd. And so they've already got this Northern group in their sights, even as they're in the process of demolishing the second group. And so some of the, the ex post facto fingers of blame that get pointed to people like Chicago, uh, Captain oh. Boyd, Bode, Bode on, on Chicago, you know, not sending off a sighting report. Yeah, okay, he dropped the ball in that respect. But given the fact that the Japanese already had the tactical drop on the northern group already, you know, their onset was going to be sufficiently swift to destroy the northern group pretty much no matter what they did, I think. Where, where do you come down on that? Yeah, I think so. Uh, because one of the things, and I'm indebted for recent conversations with Rich Frank, who for yeah. listeners may not be aware, but he's written a very uh, exhaustive and fairly definitive account of, of Guadalcanal, you know, across all the different spectrums of fighting. Uh, but one of the points that, that Rich made is at this point in the war, the U.S. Navy has not worked out clear formulations for how to maintain a high state of readiness for extended periods. Right. right. So what you've got is sort of a peacetime mentality uh, where you know, officers are just sort of saying, OK, well, we'll we'll just bear it, you know, rather than creating structures and rotations in place that everyone is getting a s sufficient amount of rest to to maintain readiness. They're, they're, they're not doing that. So that's a problem. So that's a lot a of the officers aboard the, the, the northern cruisers, especially, uh, are in various states of exhaustion. And so that hinders their ability to respond quickly. The other thing is they're set up to be able to respond to, you know, a potential 
submarine attack. There's a lot of emphasis in terms of the disposition and other things about right. let's be able to man the secondary batteries quickly, you know, in case you find a surface submarine, because, you know, at that time, uh, submarines were often attacked on the surface at night. So the secondary batteries are manned and ready. The main batteries aren't. And so they pass to general quarters and, you know, begin to close all the watertight doors. But at the same time, they're having to get members of the crew to their main battle stations to equip these main battery guns. And one of the things that is notable in some of the action reports from those three U.S. cruisers, Astoria, Quincy, Vincennes, is that process hinders their ability to actually get ready as fast as they might possibly do so. Uh, so you have, you know, people trying to undog doors to get to their their fighting stations while japanese shells are are falling around them yeah. um, so they're yeah they are caught unawares and earlier warning you know patterson destroyer patterson does send out a warning but you know the the northern cruisers are in the midst of a turn at the time that message gets lost doesn't make it to the right people in time i don't think there's much that the southern group could have done to ensure that the northern group would have been ready aside from perhaps the destroyer pickets, you know, which have been uh, patrolling yeah. outside the sound. If they had been able to cite the Japanese and send a warning in time, that might have made a difference. Um, but they couldn't. They yeah. Didn't. Yeah. Well, and, you know, I'm not going to let pass an opportunity to take a dig at Richmond mm -hmm. Kelly Turner here, too, and just <laughs> point out. I the knew fact, I left you for a reason. <laughs> well, my God, you know, um, the tactical dispositions that were used here were Turner's, you know, well, they were Crutchley's, but Turner approved them. And furthermore, uh, it was Turner who had assessed the sighting reports that, you know, we had seen Makawa's force coming down the slot. And yes, he had done a good job of doubling back sometimes to sort of try to spoof some of the scout planes and blah, 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 blah. But at the end of the day, Turner based his assessment instead of on enemy capabilities rather on what he perceived enemy intentions as being. And the result was that he got his squadron blown out of the water. And yet, you know, he manages to walk away from this fiasco with his career intact, mostly by stabbing uh, Frank Jack Fletcher in the back and making him the scapegoat. So not a shining moment uh, in uh American naval history uh, from a tactical and an operational perspective, I would say. No, but it it is, a. I think, the whole arc, like, so the invasion and then the Japanese response is is an interesting study in the contingent nature of, uh, of human combat, right? Because pretty much up until Makawa sails into the sound, things have gone remarkably well for the yes. United States and its allies. Right. So they aren't sighted on their approach, despite the fact that Japanese search planes, you know, are, yeah. are navigating the area. So they surprise the Japanese defenders. They fight off uh, uh, intense air attacks from Rabaul uh, with relatively little damage. Uh, the Marines are uh, they secure the, the islands around Tulagi. So that can start to begin to be used as an anchorage. They capture the location of the airfield. Everything. It just, yeah. just sort of falls the, 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 the way of the attackers. And then Makawa enters the sound and, and the situation flips. Everything lines up uh, for uh, for him. Uh, and, yeah. and like we said, he escapes more more or less unscathed, aside from losing one of those older cruisers on the way back to Rabaul. Right. Yeah. Of Cock all of things, it. an S-class submarine. Yeah, S-38. That's right. <laughs> Of course, you know, there's also the, the denouement of, of the battle in a tactical sense is Mikawa declining to go after the transport anchorage when he had that opportunity. And I've actually done a 180 on this, um, you know, earlier when I was writing about this in, on Combined Fleet. I, I was like, well, I can kind of see where Mikawa was coming from uh, on that score. But it was the wrong decision. Um, and in this, he's he's very much being shaped by his doctrine, which is telling him, and Trent, you and I have had, you know, numerous discussions about this, that the Japanese Navy, you know, their prophet is is Alfred Thayer Mahan, but they have a very, um, I don't want, twisted version uh, or a, a version that has been redacted through the their lens of always being the underdog against a more powerful American battle line, which means that 
their entire Navy is oriented towards destroying enemy combatants. If you're not blowing up an enemy warship, you're doing something wrong. And so in that ethos, if I have won a great surface action, which Makawa just has, sea control should just automatically devolve to my side. I don't have to worry about the enemy's logistics. That's going to take care of itself. But in retrospect, it would have been worth, you know, the sacrifice of some or maybe even all of Makawa's warships that night to sink all of those transports because that would have cut the logistical basis for this operation off at the knees and might have ended it right there. But instead, we're going to get this six-month slogging match uh, in, instead because Makawa decides not to go after those transports. Yeah, there's so many, so many navies in World War One and World War Two seem to have stopped reading Mahan once they got to the bit on decisive battle. Yeah, they don't, right. I, I think I did a video about that where it, it was based essentially like half of it was just a rant pointing out that Mahan doesn't say you win by get, having a decisive battle. He says you have a decisive battle to break the enemy's control of the sea. Then here's a whole other section on how you take control of the sea right, once right. the enemy battle fleet can't challenge you, and everyone's just like. Oh, so we get control of the sea once we win the big battle. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, like John said, it just naturally flows, right? But, right. but if you, I think, if you look at the 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 history of the that the Imperial Japanese Navy brings to World War II, there's some logic to this idea, right? They right. do this to the the Russian Navy, yes, in the, in the Japanese War, and victory ensues, oh, right? So yeah, yeah it worked. Uh, well, and. It I think there's also um, a misunderstanding, too, because the, the Japanese Navy has been reading the press releases and they've seen what's been happening on the ground during the first part of this operation, you know, this war as well. You know, so far as they know, all that needs to happen now, there, there aren't that many Americans on Guadalcanal. There's maybe a battalion or a regiment at tops, you know. So, you know, having won this battle we'll bring down a regiment of, of Imperial army troops and they're going to destroy these guys because that's what the Imperial army has been doing to everybody for the first six months of this war. So yeah, there's a, there's a bunch of sort of pernicious factors that, that come into play and, and ends up robbing the Japanese of what could have been an absolutely stupendous killer victory that Makawa doesn't end up following up on that opportunity, as you say, Drac, to, mm. to then, Okay, now I'm going to actually go ahead and get sea control. Yeah. So obviously, there's multiple night actions, which, uh, to be honest, incredibly badly named, in my opinion, because uh -huh. the Japanese call it like the the nth battle of Savo Island half the mm. time. Um, and then, of course, you have the night battle of Guadalcanal, which is just like, so was Savo Island not a night battle of Guadalcanal? <laughs> <laughs> right. And then there's the second night. It's just like, I end up, I end up usually calling it, the, you know, the skirmish with Kirishima and friends, followed by right. the skirmish with Kirishima. <laughs> yeah. Um, but right. uh, with all these various night actions, how are they matching up to what the both both sides think they were going to be doing um, in the, based on their pre-war experience? Are the Japanese going? Yes, this is exactly what we thought was going to happen because obviously, you know, they don't. It doesn't always go their way. Um, and likewise with the Americans. Well, for for the Americans, this is this is not what they had anticipated uh, at all, right? We had said earlier, uh, both sides are thinking about um, large fleet action, night night battle in that context. So penetrate an enemy screen, use destroyers or, or long range torpedoes to to get into that screen, hit the heavy ships with them, prepare things for a battle line action which will follow you know the next day or or you know a, a couple of days later uh and this is not that at all right this is a fight right. at the end of very lengthy supply lines and it's all uh, all the context after Savo Island is is anchored on you know Guadalcanal and how how does it get reinforced and resupplied and so the Japanese have a real problem in that they they have to restrict the capabilities of Allied air power. They want to bombard the airfield. So you know the next three actions after Savo are all triggered by that desire. Right. Let's bombard the airfield. Uh, and so the next battle, Cape Esperance, in October 
1942. Uh, this is led on the U.S. side by Rear Admiral Norman Scott. And Scott had commanded the third of the uh, formations, the defensive formations uh, in the Sound at Savo Island, the one that didn't get engaged. But he was very close and observed recognized that distributed formations were a problem. Now, that is something the U.S. Navy had recognized before the war. So John's criticism of, of the dispositions there is, is really well-founded. Uh, but Scott sort of goes the opposite extreme. Uh, I will have a very compact linear formation, destroys at the van, destroys at the rear. Uh, I'll call it a double header. So it engage on any flank, uh, depending on, you know, regardless of where the enemy shows up, we'll be able to fight. And he really concentrates on gunnery right cruiser gunnery is going to be how scott is going to fight the battle uh destroyer torpedoes well i mean they'd be nice if we get an opportunity to mm -hmm. use them but uh you know the formation doesn't really allow for that very well and so he's fortunate in that he you know has an opportunity by you know crossing the t of the approaching japanese bombardment formation doesn't really have a good sense in terms of you know situational awareness of what's happening right. There is this lovely confusion over the word Roger because, you know, toward the end of the line mm -hmm. is uh, Cruiser Helena, which, as John mentioned before, has these rapid firing uh, modern six inch guns, 15 of them. Yeah. Uh, and her uh, bruiser, her uh, commanding officer, Gilbert Hoover, you know, sees the Japanese coming They're They're in the sights. The guns are lined up. The fire control is, is on and basically says, you know, can I open fire? Now, the word Roger is in the signal book uh, short for opening fire. So Helena sends to the flagship San Francisco, where Scott is, uh, interrogatory Roger, basically asking, hey, can I open fire? Uh, unfortunately, as most of us are familiar, Roger is also used to acknowledge receipt of a message. So San Francisco sends back Roger. And Helena interprets this liberally. Says, "Oh, <laughs> he has to open fire. We got a yes." Boom! And from from the back of the cruiser line, and the U.S. cruisers open fire. Um, Scott is sort of thrown off by this, but fortunately, most of the the captains and the fire control officers aboard the ships recognize what's happening um, and begin to pour shells into into the Japanese formation. Uh, and so, this is an opportunity for the United States to sort of you know capitalize on the surprise. And turn the tables a little bit after after Savo Island. Um, I'm sure John can take it from there and discuss some of the Japanese point of view. Yeah, well, the, the problem for the Japanese is that they're, uh, whereas they had been so alert uh, during Savo Island in this particular engagement, they are very complacent because, again, we have to remember that from August 8th until October now, American warships have been absent from the sound because... Gormley, the, the theater commander, was uh, just too anxious to try using them again against the Japanese. And it, the, the catalyst for this battle is Nimitz actually coming down and saying to Gormley, move your force here. I want you to be interdicting the entrance to the sound. So Makawa was not expecting enemy warships. Not only that, there was a, a resupply group that was actually ahead of Makawa's group that was unloading its supplies in Iron Bottom Sound and actually has, in essence, been trapped there now by uh, um, the, the appearance of this American force. But so far as Makawa knows, when his lookouts start telling him, hey, I'm starting to see some ships up ahead, he's like, oh, that's probably the resupply group that's that's coming up the, it's, um, the street. It's Goto, right? Not Makawa. Oh, no. I'm so sorry. Good Lord. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I only had one cup of tea this morning. That's what I'm going to blame it on. Yeah, <laughs> Goto. <laughs> Lord. Anyway. Um. Yeah, and so he's he's completely bamboozled, doesn't know what he's looking at. Uh, the lookouts are telling him, uh, you know, and we're having the same thing happening on the Americans, too. I mean, um, you know, the range dials are, are spinning down on both these these forces to the point that uh, one of the Americans in, in one of the radar operators, I think, you know, we've got the range down to four or five thousand yards at this point, And they're like, what are we going to do, board them? You know, <laughs> so... When the yeah, when the guns do finally open up, 
uh, Goto on, on uh, Cruiser Aoba very quickly starts flashing recognition signals towards the Americans saying, you know, I'm Aoba, I'm Aoba, you know, you're firing on, on you know, friendly forces here. And uh, of course, did not receive friendly answers in response. So yeah, it, it was a hot mess as far as, as the Japanese were concerned. And they turned tail and basically run um, and lose a heavy cruiser and a destroyer in the process. So not not a good outing as far as the Japanese are concerned. Yeah, but I, one of the things that I think is really interesting is both sides are, well, you, you, can, you can see this confusion, right? Because there had been two Japanese formations in the sound that night. So, oh, are these friendlies? Not right. sure. Hesitation. But they're also wrestling with just how fast these actions unfold and how difficult it is to make sense of what's happening and maintain control. Like, so, right. uh, as I'm sure most people who've uh, followed Cape Esperance know, you know, it, it, Scott inverts the, the movement of his formation, does this column turn, but his destroyers and cruisers turn at the same time. And so he's confused because he's not sure where his van destroyers are. Some right. of them are in between the forces and getting hit by U.S. ships. Uh, and Duncan goes off and is, you know, thinks, oh, hey, here's the approaching Japanese. I'm going to make a torpedo attack and and, and does. But uh, it's now no man's land and just yes, blown to, yeah. no man's land being hit by both sides and, and, right. and is sunk. Uh, so these it unfolds very quickly and it's very hard to keep track of what's going on and exert any kind of any kind of control yeah yeah i, th I think that's that's a a problem that a, the modern reader has difficulties getting their heads around we think of these warships oh they're only going 20 some knots it's 20 miles an hour you know that's that's not very fast at all but when you have two formations that are closing on each other at those speeds we're talking you know motorway speeds and the inertia of these formations has the effect of uh, making making these actions unfold very, very rapidly. And in a number of cases, you see that things kind of get away from the commanders. They no longer can exert control over their formations. And these battles just take on a life of their own as, you know, the battle of uh, Friday the 13th, I think, is the most preeminent example coming up. Anyway. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what is is that that Karishima and friends? <laughs> Karishima and friends. <laughs> I like I, I say he and friends, but you know, same thing. Yeah. Yeah. So um I suppose that's a good good way to to move on to the the um, I guess the middle part of the Guadalcanal campaign. Um I was actually I wanted to step back and mm -hmm. and talk a little bit about the the Japanese perspective of, of where they're at. I think Trent made a really interesting point. You know, were these fights unfolding the way that the Japanese thought that they should or not? I think at a tactical level, they were very comfortable with how these actions had been turned, had been turning out. It's at the strategic level that you see the Japanese being so slow in reacting to the realities of this new battlefield because Guadalcanal is nothing like what their pre-war doctrine tells them the decisive battle is going to look like. You know, they have this mental model of there's going to be this clash of warships in the middle of the Pacific, you know, we're going to be wide open spaces, blue water, navy, blah, 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 blah. You know, a malarial hellhole island with a crappy airfield on it is not exactly what they conceive of as being uh, a decisive battle area. And so throughout this campaign, you see the Japanese being a day late and a dollar short in terms of the forces that they're willing to push into the middle of the table to actually win this thing. That, you know, they start out the land side of things by first sending down a reinforced battalion that gets shot to pieces and then following it up with a regiment that gets shot to pieces. And only by October... Are they really getting serious and saying, well, geez, maybe we ought to put a division into this place? So that's a real problem for the Japanese. They're, they're unwilling to commit the forces that honestly could have won them this campaign. I think during this time period from late September to late October, there's a real window for here for them to you know just punch our lights out and destroyed us and knocked us out of this campaign. But they just can't get their heads around, you know, is Bottle Canal the real thing? I just don't know. So anyway, 
now we can do uh, Friday the 13th if, mm -hmm. if you want. Mm -hmm. But I just I wanted to bookend that because Trent had summarized that so nicely on the American side. Fair enough. So, uh, yeah, well, the Friday the 13th, it's uh, it, it, it's go time for both both sides. Right. You know, Various ships. I mean, the, one of the interesting things is, you know, again, we said it's Iron Bottom Sound for a reason, but just how much of a meat grinder is involved mm. in that, you know, by the time we get to, to Friday the 13th, there are some ships like Helena that have been around in previous actions, but so many ships have gone down on both sides, both in the night actions and in associated air attacks during the day and sub hunts yeah, and so yeah. forth. But there's a lot of ships now being committed that are either new in theater or previously have not been committed to to um the the night actions and now we have a pair of japanese battle cruisers and and escorts coming down to try and shoot up henderson field again and u.s forces moving in to stop them although obviously not necessarily understanding just how much of a force the japanese have, have sent right. um so i guess but yeah part one of the big showdown right and, and from a strategic standpoint, now we are in the middle of November. And yes, the Japanese have finally, in the wake of the defeat of the ground attack by the Sendai Division at the end of October, they're like, okay, you know, we got to get real here. We got to fix the supply problem on Guadalcanal, which means not only do we have to bring in fresh troops, but we've got to supply the ones that we've already got. And the only way we can do that is with a supply convoy. We got to you know, get past this nonsense of trying to run supplies in via destroyer. That's, that's, you know, romper room stuff. We got to bring down transports. The only way we've ever been able to put Henderson out field out of commission for any appreciable length of time is to bring battleships down to the sound and blow the bejesus out of this place. And that's what we're going to do again. Now we're going to bring a convoy down from Shortland. We're going to bring heavy combat units down from truck uh, and so down comes Admiral Kondo with all four uh, of the fast battleships, along with the carrier Junyo. And most of those ships are going to loiter off of Antong Java Atoll, north of Guadalcanal. But he sends a bombardment force down with Hiei, Kirishima, and a pack of destroyers. And as you say, it is game on. And Turner, for his part, has brought a convoy in, and now he's got some decisions to make. And Trent, I toss it over to you. Yeah. Well, first, I want to say, you know, it's it's valuable context. You know, Scott wins that victory at Cape Esperance, but it, it's just a couple of days later that the, that's when the Japanese send the battleships in the first time. Right. Right. If you look, read a Marine accounts who were there, right, yeah. this this bombardment is a whole Life. different spectrum than life altering. Yeah, <laughs> than what the Japanese were delivering with heavy cruisers, right? So 14-inch gun battleships show up, cruise through the sound, and you know, nothing's there to oppose them, and you know, destroy gasoline, airplanes, revetments, all kinds of things. You know, it's just Henderson Field is put in a very, very sorry state. And so they know they can do it, they want to do it again. Uh important from the context is now. Vice Admiral Gormley, who you mentioned, uh, John, has been replaced. He's been replaced, you know, in late October uh, because Nimitz, after goading him, still feels like he's not sufficiently, uh, let's say, offensively minded, not yeah. convinced of victory in the campaign. Uh, so right. he's been replaced with Admiral Halsey, who no one would ever say was not sufficiently <laughs> offensively minded. Yeah. So this is a very different disposition amongst U.S. leaders. Halsey brings, you know, according to the the Marines, a breath of fresh air because he goes and he visits them very quickly, something that Gormley never did. Yeah, And so he's intent on supporting the, the Marine position. So, you know, Turner's got that in that context. Uh, he has just delivered. Uh, there's been another delivery of, of additional you know, troops and supplies. So it's, it's sort of two reinforcement efforts you know, meet at Guadalcanal at more or less the same time. Turner's leaving, but now word that the Japanese are sending battleships down comes in. And so Turner takes the, the group of escorting vessels that are available to these two to these two convoys, fits them together, places them under Rear Admiral Daniel Callahan, who grabs them now the other group is under norman scott so callahan and scott callahan's a little bit senior so he's in command 
uh, and Scott and Callahan take uh, sort of a, an approach that is similar to Scott's in the sense that like, hey, let's use the linear formation again. It seemed to work before, but now it's much longer. Right? It's not a compact double header. It's 13 ships long and he weaves it into the sound. And I think, you know, there's there have been a lot of criticisms of, of Callahan over the years in various in various histories. Well, one of the things that I think is really important is he he knows the context very well. He had been uh, on Gormley's staff, so he knows what's going on in the campaign. He knows the survival of Henderson Field is vital to being able to uh, destroy uh, Japanese efforts to to reinforce the island. So he's got sort of a, a barrier that can prevent that bombardment, or at least he thinks it can. Uh, so as reports from other ships because he's in san francisco which is a cruiser that doesn't have sophisticated search radar she's got the old sc radar as reports about the position and the movement of the japanese formation come in he changes his course a couple times and is heading for them there have been some analyses that suggest he's trying to cross the t i don't think he's trying to cross the t at all i think i don't think that can be substantiated by any of the evidence he's looking for a collision now this makes a lot of sense given pre-war u.s expectations because right. the idea was you would take one of these night search and attack formations and you would collide in the enemy formation and i think he's assuming because battleships are coming they will probably be screened so we have to fight through the screen uh and that's that's what i think he's anticipating and the ships the formations collide uh, and we'll get into it. John's waving his well, fingers. Well, no, and, and what I wanted to, <laughs> what, what I wanted to say was, Trent, you completely changed my way of thinking about this battle. You know, between the time I started writing my Pacific narrative twelve years ago, mm -hmm. and now, um, because at that time I sort of painted Callahan as being kind of the goat here that didn't know what he was doing, but you, you explained, I think, very persuasively. That he is operating on mental models that have been built up by interwar wargaming. And, and so talk a little bit about what those war games say in terms of what you do against an enemy battleship force if all you've got is heavy cruisers. Yeah, well, there's a, there's a couple of things that I think are, are in that mentality. Now, uh, worth noting, you know, Callahan had been skipper, the commanding officer of Cruiser San Francisco before. So he has commanded a heavy cruiser he knows what they can do he knows what their capabilities are and he'd practiced these kinds of night engagements so one thing is yeah run your force right into uh the the enemy and uh, create an opportunity by fighting your way through the enemy screen for destroyers to pass through the enemy formation and use their their torpedoes and one of the things that i think is clear from the orders that survive because i'm sure most listeners are familiar callahan dies during the battle so we we had no opportunity no one had any opportunity to interview him after the fact and ask him what he was thinking we have to sort of recreate his intentions from the orders that he issued uh, but he sends the the destroyers once the enemy screen is penetrated he gives them orders to pass directly through the enemy formation go you know course zero 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 directly north uh, and they do get into most of these destroyers, very close range skirmishes with the Japanese flagship PA. Uh, and John, when you were talking about the devastation, you know, four or five, five inch 38s could could wreak at close range. That that I think is important context there. But from a cruiser perspective, uh, Callahan is not banking on the destroyers defeating the bombardment. He's got three U.S. large cruisers, uh, San Francisco, his flagship. Portland, which is another eight-inch armed cruiser, and then Helena, which is one of these you know, six-inch gun monsters. And so he knows, based on fighting strength comparisons, because the U.S. Navy had thought about this, it didn't have any battle cruisers, didn't have an equivalent for Hiei and her sisters. How do you fight one? Well, how you fight one is you try to get to close range with your cruisers, because under 10,000 yards... If you can bring two or especially three of these large cruisers into action against one of the Japanese fast battleships or, or battle cruisers, depending on you know who you ask, uh, you can overwhelm it. You have superior fighting strength. Uh, the N-squared law comes into effect. Uh, the rate of fire of the 8-inch guns or 6-inch, in Helena's case, comes into effect. So Callahan's got this in his mind, and he knows that if he can bring his ships into it, it's a, it's a long shot. 
right? He knows it's a right. long shot. But he he yeah. thinks that if he can bring his three cruisers in turn into close range action with the two Japanese uh, battle cruisers, then he can then he can defeat them or fight them off at least and prevent the the bombardment. So that's what he tries to do, and you can see this from the the TBS, the the high frequency, very high frequency radio logs. Um, you know, at one point he's telling the cruisers, "We want the big ones." You know, so he, you know he's got the the large Japanese ships in mind. Um, which, which is a command that is sort of pilloried later after the war by the U.S. Naval War College's analysis of this action. They're just like, you know, we want the big ones. That's not a really very useful order. But I think, as you pointed out in in, in learning, that was the battle plan. We want the big ones. He's that was absolutely the explicit, you know, as to what he wants to have happen. So, yeah, but of course, it it, it doesn't work for those who who know the battle, right? Because Portland gets hit her stern is wrecked by a torpedo so she starts steaming in circles now she does fire at the japanese battleships but you know she doesn't come to close range uh and helena is farther back it's a dark night she gets confused you know fires the targets of opportunity uh so you know the for san francisco the battle right. climaxes with her engaging kie and a series of other japanese ships yeah at, at Mano, close range. Mano. But is able to penetrate the the steering gear uh, of Hie and and prevent her escape. Uh, right. So so the, the the ship is lost the next day. Of course, you know, Callahan and his staff are killed. Uh, the secondary conning position of San Francisco is wrecked. So it falls to a pair of junior officers to uh, continue to fight the ship, keep it afloat, and um, escape, uh, yeah. which which they barely do. All right. Yeah. I, from the Japanese perspective. Um, the only thing that's going to prevent this bombardment from going through is somehow the Americans have got to change Admiral Abe's mind. And the way they end up doing that is by thrusting Abe into an incredibly confusing situation that exposes him to uh, great personal risk. I mean, during the course of this engagement, you know, he a looms over the battlefield like Godzilla. It, her searchlight turning on that pins uh, cruiser Atlanta in its baleful glare, you know, like the, the eye of a you know some angry god, you know, that is sort of the crystallizing moment for this whole battle when it's everybody sort of realizes, oh my God, here we go, you know, and, and the battle erupts. He a because she is so large and she's using her searchlights just becomes a magnet for enormous helpings of firepower from every American ship that can see her. And the result is that her superstructure is set on fire. Um, Admiral Abe's chief of staff is killed outright, standing right next to him. The Admiral himself takes a blast of shrapnel to the face. And so it's this incredibly disorienting violent uh, environment that he finds himself in. He's surrounded by American ships on all sides and his, his flagship is taking a beating. And the result of all of that is that within about 10 minutes of this engagement kicking off, Abe is radioing both Kondo and Yamamoto, I'm aborting my bombardment mission and I'm trying to get out of here. Mm -hmm. um, he is going to be taken to task for that decision afterwards. He's going to be relieved of command very, very quickly. But Again, if you're the Americans trying to, you know, prevent this bombardment, really the only way you could do it was to change the enemy admiral's mind, and they they managed to do that. Yeah, a stunned it, silence. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it's it's just such a, a chaotic mess, isn't it? Because right, you know, it is. you, you're talking as I think we mentioned earlier about the fact that at this stage. Even the light anti-aircraft guns are getting involved when, yeah. when you, you've got near collisions left, right, and center, and it's such a point blank range that uh, uh, for a few destroyers on both sides, it's a case of being illuminated or being spotted, and within a matter of minutes, that's ga it's game over for that destroyer because right. whoever spotted them, whoever's got the first shot off, just keeps pouring rounds down range until the other side stops moving. Yeah, you, you think about what's happening here, you know, you're charging through this this battlefield at 30 knots and suddenly, yeah, another enemy warship looms up out of the darkness and it was black. There have been a rainstorm, you know, that night. So the 
illumination conditions were really weird and variable. So yeah, enemy looms up at point blank range. Everybody shoots at each other, and then they whiz off into the darkness, and you lose track of them again. It's it's it, yeah, it was it was a crazy show, really, um, and and very very difficult to make any tactical sense of. No one's ever done a track chart of the battle. I don't think anybody ever will. Mm -hmm. uh, although I know that Robert Lundgren, I think, is attempting it. Um, yeah, but... I, he he sent me his manuscript. I've been looking through it because I want to I want to talk to him about it. Yeah, what's but, it look like? Well, it, it's like 160 pages long. <laughs> so that's, that's him. I, I, I'm just looking. I've I've gone through it once, and now I'm going through it another again, sort of page by page, making careful notes of like, okay, this differs from the current the sort of the current commonly accepted narrative. This is the same. This track, okay, th that's this. That's going on here. Uh, it's just there's so much information to go through. Yeah. Well, I, I you know, I'll, you I'll can... be fascinated to see that just because I thought his analyses of, mm. you know, the Kirishima shoot is just brilliant. Mm. So, yeah, he does really good work. Anyway, mm. sorry, Trent, I interrupted. Oh, no, I think, yeah, that analysis mm. of uh, Kirishima's shoot is, is, is fantastic. We can get to that in a minute. But I, I feel mm. like the problem is it, it's just there are so there's so much information that conflicts mm. in primary sources. Uh, and so I feel like to it, it gets to the point relatively quickly where to to develop a coherent narrative you have to be making a choice as a historian reconstructing it and there are a lot of those choices that i don't feel comfortable making because like i'm not really sure <laughs> where yeah. that ship was or where that ship was i can say what they put in the action report i mean i can sort of triangulate from there based on other reports and other you know the secondary sources that have been analyzed and written but mm -hmm. You know, to have something that is def as definitive as a track chart, uh, I would be very wary. Yeah, mm -hmm. I I actually found writing about this particular engagement almost liberating uh, because it allowed me, as I say in my manuscript, to put down the pen of the realist and pick up the surrealist paintbrush. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just <laughs> it's so fast and crazy um, that really just just sort of coming to terms or, or coming to peace with the it it is chaos it is pure entropy and when you get comfortable that that really was what this particular engagement was that i'm no longer obligated to have a map that is in any way accurate which i'm normally super ar about mm. but in this particular engagement it's just like yeah basically the tactical formation after about two minutes of this thing is as if a child had taken 27 model warships and just dumped them in a toddler's waiting pool. You know, that's, that's what it is. It's just a hot mess. So. Yeah. I, I've, I've sometimes compared making track charts of this battle and a few others. It, it, it's kind of, you know, it's kind of like sometimes you get people asking questions about ships that have gone down with magazine explosions like hood. And there's like, well, we found the wreck. Why don't we go down and find out exactly what happened? And I was like, I was sort of pointing out, you know, when a magazine goes off, whether it's Hood or Arizona or Vanguard or whatever, it's like every bit of evidence we might have wanted to look at has been reduced to postage stamp sized bits over the next 20 miles. Right. There's right. no way you're ever putting that back together. Right. And it's a similar thing with, with this kind of battle. It's like you've got some big chunks left from what's survived. But you know there, there are ships where where that went down in that battle with almost no survivors. Um, ships that yeah. you know, all we know about them really was well, a ship showed up and then it got set on fire and went reeling off into the darkness. And based on the fact that we have all the others, it must have been them. <laughs> um, right. Yeah. So, yeah, there's, but there's what, where did that. they come from? Where did they go? How long did that ship stay afloat afterwards? Yeah, James. Oh, James Grace has done, I think, the best job of any sort of commentator that I've read about putting together. He's got a book focused on the, just this battle itself. Mm. And uh, it uh, it does a pretty good job at piecing everything together, I think. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. And, uh, we, and there we, are some parts that we know about pretty well. Like, we know mm. Bart blew up. That was one of the destroyers toward yeah. the, the, the U.S. line. Because that happens relatively early, before the toddler has sort of, you know, thrown the thing. <laughs> thrown the right. ships down yeah. into into chaos but yeah after that uh, it's just it's it's a mess and you know uh, like you say that even the the anti-aircraft batteries are are uh, in play yeah uh, i talked about helena earlier but she's a, a, an excellent example of that right at, at one point 
uh, you know, the main batteries are engaging one target, the secondary batteries are another target, and the third, you know, the anti aircraft batteries are unleashed at a third target. Right. Now, I, I don't know what that third target was. I'm not <laughs> sure that anybody does. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Anyway. It may have been a phantom. Who knows? Mm. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's the other thing that happens in these things, too. Anyway, the end result is that, uh, you know, the Americans by hook or crook managed to uh, preserve Henderson for a night at the cost of having this entire task force essentially shellacked. Uh, only Helena is reasonably intact for, as far as the cruisers are concerned. And Juno, of course, gets lost immediately the next morning to a submarine attack, yada, yada, yada. Um, and so the Japanese, however, are still planning on coming down. Hiye sinks the next morning, uh, having been the recipient of aerial attacks from both Henderson Field and also the Carrier Enterprises Air Group, which gets detached and is now going to be part of the Cactus Air Force going forward. And then there's a, an interesting little interlude. The next night, there's actually a cruiser bombardment. And Trent, and 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 thank you, Drac, for your friend doing this translation of the Senshi Sosho volume. It ain't a great translation, and it's really tough to make out, but I was able to pick out a point that I had not been aware of previously. The Japanese send down four heavy cruisers, um, under Makawa, not Goto, because Goto is dead, <laughs> under Makawa to, to bombard Henderson. He's bringing down Chokai uh, and three other cruisers. Only two of those cruisers, uh, Suzuya and Maya, end up bombarding the airfield. And the thing I picked out from Senshi Sosho, I had always wondered why Chokai and uh, it's Kinagasa, I believe, uh, didn't go after the airfield, it, they don't have the right ammunition. They switched mm -hmm. out the loadouts for the other two 8-inch cruisers and gave them more Type 3 shells and high explosive to go after that airfield. And that, I think, may feature in what is going to end up happening the following night when we get the final battleship engagement. Um, but anyway, the, that heavy cruiser bombardment is not successful. They, they miss the airfield completely. And, and away they go. And now, finally, on the night of the 14th, 15th, we have the final battleship engagement here, where Admiral Kondo, having uh, relieved Admiral Abe of command, is being told by Yamamoto, you go down to uh, Iron Bottom and you fix this thing. And he comes down to uh, the sound once again with his two heavy cruisers and Kurishima again. And I've always wondered why her sisters, Harana and Congo, did not come down with her. And I still don't know the answer to that question. Uh, there is a mention in Senshi Sosho that the Type 3 bombardment ammunition was an extremely short supply. And mm. if you look at the force dispositions within Senshi Sosho, what you see is that Harana and Congo are attached to um, what they call an anti-aircraft guard unit in support of carrier force. In other words, I think they're being dedicated to screening Junyo, which is a terrible waste of combat mm -hmm. power because Junyo is a scow and they should never even brought her down with them, in my opinion. So I, anyway, haven't gotten to the bottom of that mystery yet, but it, it, it appears that Harana and Congo were being used as screening units for this junky aircraft carrier <laughs> um, in preference to bringing them down with Kondo. Had they come along with Kondo, you know, this is one of those great what ifs. Um, you know, we're going to talk about Willis Lee and his two battleships here, I'm sure, in a second. But man, that could have been a whole different kettle of fish if the Japanese had showed up with three battleships uh at iron bottom sound on the on the night of the 14th 15th on the american side the, the only thing i can say is that even now at 80 years remove halsey's decision to commit south dakota and washington to combat in these waters just sends the hair up on the back of my spine this is terrifyingly dangerous for the americans because again Iron Bottom Sound is so constricted. 
And the, the dangers of Japanese torpedo attack by this point in the campaign are just glaringly self-evident. So this is a horrifically dangerous environment that, that Halsey is willing to push these last two capital ships into, but he's absolutely determined to fight for this airfield down to the last bloody rowboat. And so he makes the decision to send Willis Lee in with those two ships. Now I'll kick it to my friend Trent. <laughs> yeah, I feel like this is just a remarkable contrast because you're wondering, you know, what would it have been like if the Japanese had three battleships there and you know, they're they're trying to work out, you know, how best how best to bombard, how much risk to undertake. And, you know, Halsey's attitude is, you know, we don't need we don't need battleships to screen Enterprise anymore. Push them, push them into the sound. Yeah. Um, now, it's all he's got left. This is yeah. his last remaining surface action group. So if you're going to stop a bombardment, here. you're going to yeah. do it with Lee and his two battleships. And, and the four destroyers that had the most fuel remaining, not the four destroyers that were most practiced, not the four destroyers that knew how to operate together. So uh, Lee has a bit of a scratch team too. But one of the things that I think is interesting is he you know, deliberately avoids sort of the, the linear formations that Scott and then Callahan had employed. This is a little bit looser. This is just four destroyers out front, Washington and South Dakota, a little bit behind so you know lee is doing the best with the situation that he's got using his destroyers as sort of a rudimentary screen and i think that was very wise uh because in the early part well there's an initial part of the action where the japanese or the the u.s battleships open fire at uh, uh a japanese formation that's coming around sort of to the northeast of uh sabo island and, and and turn it away with their gunfire south dakota thought she sank something which she didn't but anyway uh but then the destroyers are going south of, of Savo and run into uh, their counterparts uh, yeah. on the Japanese side. And, and this, although it's, you know, again, this is another confused action. There may have been some friendly fire on the U.S. side. I think there's a reasonable argument to be made there. Uh, but what you get is uh, a destruction or a wastage, essentially, of these screening forces uh, so that Lee doesn't have to mix it up with Japanese shores with his battleships. Mm -hmm. He can hold them at a little bit of a distance and wait and see what is going to emerge. And here, you know, radar plays a, a really important role, as I'm sure a lot of people uh, have read. You know, both Washington and, and South Dakota have the more modern search radar, the SG, uh, but on Washington is mounted in such a way that it's in the forward part of the fire control tower so it's got this massive blind spot to the rear and south dakota had been following ahead falling behind she was in the blind spot and then after the u.s uh, destroyers most of them are either crippled or sinking washington skirts uh, to the far side of them so that she is not silhouetted by the flames south dakota goes the other way silhouetted by the front flames suffers electrical failures begins to get shot at by the japanese and Leaf initially is very concerned about fratricide, you know, because his fire control team is tracking a target and they are convinced it is. Yeah. An enemy. Uh, you know, and and I have I didn't I wasn't into this by the time that they were still alive, but I have, you know, secondhand references to them just being like, let us shoot, you know, essentially kind of like banging on the table. Yes, they got yeah. boot in our teeth. And they, <laughs> yeah. We have it. We ha the, the system is on. Let us open fire. And Lee is apprehensive, you know, because South yeah. Dakota had been in the blind spot. Are they tracking South Dakota now? Lost track of where South Dakota was. Not sure. Right. Don't know. And this is where the weather and the influence of these things get very important because one of the things that happens is the moon sets. And so visibility degrades. Mm -hmm. and Kondo turns on his searchlights right you know, and just fix South Dakota because they're shooting at South Dakota and boom, you know the searchlights come open and so immediately from Lee's position he's like oh wait a minute that thing is South Dakota because I can see her that thing those are the, the enemy. enemy yep and I look down at where the turrets are pointing and what a shock they're pointing that way <laughs> let yep. them have it right uh, and they do and wow <laughs> wow i think i think a word is in order here of just what an outstanding officer willis lee was and you know you couldn't have asked for a better gunnery officer to put in command of a, an engagement like this the, you know he's a a multi gold medal winning um olympic riflery 
um, champion. He has a mind which is completely comfortable with the underlying calculus that drives gunnery engagements. He is intimately familiar with radar in in a way that a lot of technicians that were 30 years younger than he was had not really embraced. This is a, uh, you would call an early adopter of, of mm-hmm. technology. And he has a, he has a gunnery team on Washington that is absolutely first rate. Um, one of the gunnery officers is an MIT graduate. I mean, and he, in the intervening two months from where he puts his flag on board, Washington has drilled this ship just to the point of perfection, there's a, an account from one of the gunnery officers on board the cruiser Atlanta when they were doing uh, gunnery shoots um, about a month prior that Washington is sitting off at 35,000 yards away from them. And the game is that she's supposed to shoot salvos into Atlanta's wake about 200 yards behind the ship. And from their vantage point on Atlanta, they're watching. They can only see the just the tops of the masts of Washington. They can see the guns go off. And then these incredibly tightly spaced nine shell salvos just nailing into Atlanta's wake over and over again. So this is a, a superbly drilled battleship by the time she gets into this engagement. So, yeah, when she opens up on Karishma at a range of around 8,000 yards, she just devastates her in very, very short order. Again, uh, alluding to the, the analysis that Lundgren did on this shoot, you know, when I was growing up as a kid, the conventional wisdom was that Washington hit Karishma with between six and nine 16 inch shells, but Lundgren shows very convincingly, I think, that she was hit by as many as 20 or more of these 16-inch shells. Um, one of the things I I did for Grins and Giggles a number of years ago, there's a friend of mine, a guy named Nathan Oaken, who wrote a face-hardened armor penetration calculator where you can feed all of these variables into his little gizmo. You know, I've got this gun firing this shell from this range and this obliquity and yada, yada, yada. Pump in all of that data, push the button, and it'll tell you, yes, will the shell go through the armor or not? Will it be decapped? Will the fuse work? You know, will the shell be distorted, et cetera, et cetera. From this range and this obliquity, when Washington opens up on Karishima, those 16 inch shells have enough kinetic energy to punch a hole through her belt, go all the way through the ship and out the opposite belt. <laughs> and that would never have happened because American fuses were good, you know, <laughs> but it gives you the sense of, you know, Karishima might as well have been made out of tissue paper as far as her ability to resist this shell fire at this range. And she's absolutely blown to pieces. One of the other pieces that's kind of interesting, though, about this is that she's not blown to pieces. The more I've thought about this, I don't understand why she did not end up in a pile of scrap metal a la the hood. That if she's hit by as many shells as she was, and, you know, you've got then multi-hundred pound chunks of junk getting blown through her hull, uh, I, the fact that one of those chunks didn't connect with something in a magazine and, and, you know, send her up like a volcano, I don't quite understand. But the net result is that she's just absolutely pulverized in about two minutes and just slobbers out of line and she's done. Yeah, it's one of the things when, when I was lo- looking into doing doing a video on Admiral Lee, it's like, how often does the Admiral come down to the gunnery crew and the radar crew and go, no, 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 you're doing this wrong. I'm going to tell you how to do it properly and is actually right. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and yeah, as you said, you know, I think the only thing, the only reason Kirishima doesn't go up in a massive fireball is probably just because it's so close range. So all these shells are coming in practically horizontally and obviously the magazines mm. are well below the waterline. So there's probably an awful lot of stuff that's intercepting things. And I rather suspect she was taking on water very quickly. Yeah, um, so yeah. um, I'm reminded kind of when Boise had a magazine explosion, you know, she, initially the magazine starts to cook off and theoretically that she should have gone up in a, in a ball of flame. But the, the shit, that's one example of the Japanese shells diving capability working. 
So it's worked to cause the magazine fire, but then it counterintuitively works against them because there's a ton of water following the shell, which puts right. the fire out. So Boise's right. still intact. Well, not intact, but she's been one piece um, instead of 60 million. And I probably, I think it, you we probably find there's some very ironic things going on with Kirishima if anyone ever, you know, pulls a few of the hull plates off and goes inside the wreck. We'll right. probably find that, yeah, actually there probably were fires in the magazine but there were so many 16 inch holes appearing in the side of the ship. There's probably yeah. a deluge of water coming down as well, keeping her alive. Um, yeah. Paradoxically. If I remember Lundgren's analysis correctly, mm. the magazine started to flood pretty quickly, or at least there were orders to mm. flood the magazines relatively quickly Yeah, um, mm. because of fires, like you mentioned. Mm. Um, but it's been some time since I read it closely. Yeah, no, I, I think you're right, and uh, he does. He does mention we we know from Kirishima's action reports that a couple of her turrets were knocked out. That actually says sort of good things about the powder discipline within the Japanese gunnery crews. Mm. That you know, yeah, she took hits to her turrets uh, that were probably fatal to them, but again, the ship did not did not go up in a fireball. So the net result, though, you know, as I say, she's just just pulverized and, mm. and out of the battle the americans get lucky though uh in that the japanese put a large number of torpedoes in the water none of which connects with either south dakota or washington although a number of them come you know frighteningly close south dakota at this point is trying to you know limp out of the out of the area lee faints northwest towards the oncoming convoy to kind of bait the japanese into following him for a little bit and thereby leaving his his couple of crippled destroyers in the south dakota um kind of takes them out of the picture but eventually he decides that you know discretion is the better part of valor and it, it's time to come about and it's a good thing he did because again the japanese have got a ton of of fish in the water but none of them connect so again to this larger theme of it this whole campaign it just flip-flopped back and forth mm. as to who has got who's rolling the lucky dice today yeah. and yeah tonight is not the japanese night because it, we easily could have taken some torpedo hits on on those battleships yeah and it's yeah. It, it, it bears repeating just how much of a risk that was because I'm almost reminded of um, I don't know if you've seen uh, the 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 film Despicable Me, yeah, with Gru and the Minions. But it's like yeah, you almost I almost imagine Gru in a U.S. Navy uniform briefing Halsey the night before. It's just like in terms of escorts, we have no escorts. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's like this this is what we've got left. Yeah, and, and it is it is a huge risk because if you think about it, it's like the U.S. has three fast battleships at this point: North Carolina, Washington, and south dakota it's like okay indiana and massachusetts and alabama are coming online um but south dakota is pretty much fresh out of the yards and she's the lead lead ship of the class north carolina has been torpedoed uh in yeah. the instant that cost the navy the wasp so these are the only two operational fast battleships that the u.s navy has period let alone in the theater and they're being committed with as you said, it's not not even the four best destroyers or four destroyers that have any idea how to work. It's like which like sound off. Which of you actually has fuel? <laughs> um, can we take you out? And by the time they're actually in contact with with the Japanese main force, those four destroyers are gone. So yeah. you know, any any single thing going right for the Japanese past that point, the U.S. could have been out out of its fast battleship force for a, a while and of course as we know from the uh from santa cruz and eastern solomons the battleships served both as very useful anti-aircraft escorts when the japanese attacks were coming in there and also as uh, hilariously enough decoys <laughs> um, the, the south one of south dakota's guns was non-functional at this point because she'd had a chunk of it knocked out by a japanese bomb which could otherwise have been directed to Enterprise or Saratoga. So there's multiple layers to the risks that are being taken at this stage, but yeah. it pays off. Yeah. 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 Very, very serious risk. One of the things that's worth noting about the context of the campaign and some of the influence on Halsey's uh, thinking and, and, and Nimitz's approach is, you know, John, you had mentioned earlier that the Japanese are trying to do, you know, Port Moresby part two, the overland campaign. 
right? And so uh, General MacArthur, the commander of the Southwest Pacific Theater, is is anxious about his naval situation. You know, the, the Japanese could uh, attempt some other sort of amphibious operation in New in New Guinea. And so when Nimitz comes to the South Pacific to visit with Gormley, he also visits with representatives of MacArthur's theater and they're critical. They're like, you know, why is the whole Navy operating here off Wall Canal? And, and Nimitz's point is, well, this is the spot where we need to stop them because if they want to get into the Coral Sea, they've got to come around here. They've got to cut, a, they've got to come between, you know, Spiritu Santo and Guadalcanal. And right now we've got sort of this lock on that passage and they can't really get into the coral sea effectively so we're protecting you macarthur and your australian friends uh from a japanese amphibious assault here at guadalcanal so this is it's the anchor not just for the south pacific area and that campaign but from a naval perspective also the southwest pacific campaign and, and so you know halsey's got to be thinking about how do i win not just for me how do i win for me macarthur and the allies as a whole that's that's a great point. Um, and, and there's a follow on to that, because if you view these two campaigns, New Guinea and Guadalcanal as a whole, which is how the Japanese look at this whole thing. You know, we as Americans tend to overfocus on Guadalcanal. The Australians all write about New Guinea from the Japanese perspective, which I think is really the valid one. You know, these are twin heads of the same monster that are just eating them alive. I will say that for all that the Navy does a wonderful job, you know, all in all in the Solomon's campaign, it's pretty disgraceful that there were, there was essentially zero American Naval presence off the North shore of New Guinea. You know, we are lugging supplies up to the fight that's going on in Boonagona using schooners and coastal luggers, you know, 32nd Infantry Division goes into that battle without a single 105 millimeter howitzer, which mm -hmm. for an army that, you know, its whole doctrinal basis is we kill people with artillery <laughs> instead of <laughs> human life. You know, it was absolutely scandalous that that division was in combat with so little in the way of artillery fire backing it up. So you know, Rich Frank uh, has said to me on a number of occasions that, yeah, when it comes to New Guinea, that portion of the campaign, the, the U.S. Navy does not exactly cover itself in glory. But then again, just given the, the sheer commitment that we had to make just to win at Guadalcanal, there weren't a whole hell of a lot of surface units just lying around, even destroyers. We needed every single one we could get our hands on. You know, I don't know what the doctrinal um, how many destroyers would have been an adequate screen for two modern fast battleships, but I'm damn sure that four is not the answer. <laughs> four, four is not the answer. I, th I, th I think, I think answer. Four, four is, if I'm remembering the fleet, the fleet problem dimensions, I think four isn't even enough for one screening group when yep. they position the screening groups all around in a circle. Right. I think it's six is the, number you have a, a, like up front you have six there and then six there and then six and six so it's like you're not even not even one screening group let alone the actual whole fleet screen yeah yeah which which is an important element of this the, just speaking about uh you know destroyers it, it's not so impactful during the Guadalcanal canal campaign i mean we're talking about this fight uh but you know there were more, more destroyers available just didn't have fuel but as it goes on you know it becomes extremely costly in terms of these seemingly minor combatants destroyers yeah. especially on the japanese side and that restricts ability to do other things you know because you don't have then the escort or the screening forces for uh, other uh, fleet actions or or other things that you'd like to do with your navy so it, yeah. it, it, it's an important factor ultimately yeah the attritional engine by this point in this campaign is just grinding both navies up uh, the carrier forces are already wrecked by the time we get done with this particular fray, uh, the Japanese are, you know, they can't deal with the attrition in terms of fast battleships anymore either. And this is one of the things that's going to lead to their decision. It's just like, we lost two battleships in the course of three nights. We just can't keep doing this. You know, this is, this is impossible. 
Um, but then, of course, uh, this campaign being the way it is, just two weeks after we win this, you know, climactic engagement uh, comes the battle of Tassafaranga. <laughs> Which is the last 1942 surface yes. night action. Yeah. Well, and of any significant size, there's there's two, a couple of uh, New Zealand corvettes go after <laughs> the <laughs> submarine that outmasses both of them, but that's Fair. a completely separate thing. <laughs> so Tassafaranga. Yeah. Just lay the groundwork here on Carlton Wright's assumption of command, because you know that far better than I do. Um, but well, what I think is really interesting. So it, you can see lessons being absorbed. I, I sort of talk about Scott's adaptation, Lee's decision not to use a linear formation. The, the U.S. Navy is thinking through some of these these challenges very much in the theater. But by the time Tassaranga occurs, really by the time the 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 prior two naval battles are are being fought, there is uh, another cycle of learning that's happening at the Pacific Fleet level. So by the time Tassaranga occurs, two new uh, tactical publications have come out. One is about uh, introducing the Combat Information Center. So I talked about how search radars are more of a cognitive problem. Uh, and the, the the combat information center is designed to address that. We can talk more about that in in a little bit. Uh, but also, there's new uh, set of instructions for how to conduct a night search and attack, or this kind of night action. And in it, uh, Admiral Nimitz and his staff have hearkened back to uh, sort of early concepts in the U.S. Navy from like the 1920s about, hey, look, radar gives you an advantage, so you could attack stealthily and with surprise try to do that you know because surprise is very important that's obvious through these through these battles uh and radar can create an edge and if you can use coordinated formations to attack from multiple directions at at, at once so that's in the mix now and uh rear admiral uh, thomas kincaid has been given command of a surface action group there in the south pacific he had been commanding the carrier forces Right. Uh, of Santa Cruz. So, you know, he's an experienced officer and he's taking this in and okay. So I've got an, an opportunity to sort of form a force and drill what we're going to do. We'll still have a mixed cruiser destroyer force because we agree that this makes sense. And this is how we're, we're used to fight. We're used to fighting, but we'll, we'll take in these new instructions that have come from Nimitz and, and the Pacific fleet staff. We'll use destroyers, uh, send them out ahead they will make a, a radar-assisted torpedo attack on the enemy. And at the, about the same time as their torpedoes are arriving, that's when the cruisers will open fire. And we'll try to keep the cruisers out of enemy torpedo water by keeping them at about 10,000 yards away from the enemy. Now, you that can see- That should be this plenty. Is, yeah, well, this is this is mirror imaging because that's, right. about, that's beyond effective range of US torpedoes. It is so not beyond Gosh. effective range of Japanese torpedoes, but- they, you know, they don't know that. See that they don't know that. You can see his thinking. So, so Kincaid has this, has this plan, has this concept in place. But he gets picked. Right? There are challenges in the North Pacific. Uh, Admiral Nimitz needs a new naval commander there. Uh, Kincaid seems to be the best fit. Uh, he has enough knowledge of of coalition uh, warfare uh, through earlier experience in his uh, career, so he could. There's a perception that he can work well with the army and the Canadians. Take him, send him to the North Pacific. Great, okay, but that's like two days before right. the battle actually occurs. Carlton Wright gets command of his task force. Wright has a little bit less familiarity with the with the doctrine, a little bit less familiarity with his subordinates, and so on. And he gets given two additional destroyers on his way to. Uh, Iron Bottom Sound to to stop a, a Japanese reinforcement effort, which is now a little bit different than what they had been trying to do. Right, they're not trying to bombard the airfield this this evening. They are instead just trying to use um, the drums, you know, to yeah, send supplies drums. and uh, to 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 Guadalcanal, you know, dump them off of the destroyer. So it's a destroyer force. So Carlton Wright steams into Iron Bottom Sound with destroyers in van and destroyers in the rear, which has led some commentators to say, oh, it's the same kind of formation that the U.S. were using before. Well, no, very different, uh, different assumptions. The two destroyers at the rear are just parked back there because they had no chance to practice, no opportunity to familiarize themselves with the doctrine. So basically, they're just tag-alongs. And 
the destroyer Fletcher is leading the the column. Uh, Willie, William Cole is uh, commanding Fletcher, and and I think in in my estimate, I mean, Wright deserves more blame, but but Cole does something that I don't think is quite right. He approaches firing position, and on his way asks, "Hey, can I shoot? You know, can I let go with my torpedoes?" And Wright, being less familiar with you know the 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 fast moving pace of these battles, says no cautions him to, to hold fire uh in the intervening time the japanese begin to get a sense of what's going on yeah R uh cole's opportunity for an effective use of his torpedoes passes he does fire them but he fires them at a very uh unfortunate angle so they're not going to hit and meanwhile right opens fire with his cruisers uh john you alluded to the fact that the one japanese destroyer which presents the brightest radar target gets inundated yeah uh, but then the Japanese fall back on their well-practiced doctrine and here come the torpedoes. Right. Yeah. Because of the gun flashes on the northern horizon, all of these uh, destroyers who do not have reloads at this point, they've offloaded their torpedo reloads in order to make displacement for these supply drums that they're uh, that they're hauling around. And and so this is a this is a, a force that is pathetically outgunned by the Americans who are bringing five cruisers to this party. And, you know, we've got eight destroyers, six of which don't even have torpedo reloads. But as soon as the Americans, you know, open up on Takanami, now the, the torpedo officers on these um, supply destroyers are like, well, there's gun flashes there, 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 and there set up their spreads, put 44 torpedoes in the water, and then uh, head for the exits as fast as they can go. The Americans, meanwhile, obligingly continue on their base course, uh, unaware that these fish are heading for them and collect their just reward in the form of you know multiple explosions. Uh, Minneapolis collects two. Uh, Northampton gets two as well, doesn't she? I, I, I think. think. So. I think. Minneapolis becomes, uh, you know, here in, in my, my home city of Minneapolis, Minneapolis is the only cruiser or any combatant that I'm aware of that manages to collect two long lances and does not sink. Uh, but the rest of the force is just blown apart. Northampton does go down. Two of the other American cruisers lose their bows. Um, and it's just it's a walkover uh, as far as the Japanese are concerned. They get out of there only having lost Takanami and her crew and, you know, turn the tables on the Americans in what should have been a completely lopsided contest the other way. But none of the resupply drums make it to the island. Too true. And, you know, from the standpoint of General Hyakutake, uh, commander of 17th Army, who's standing on the sands of Lunga Point, well, not Lunga Point, but Tassaparanga, you know, I'm, my force is still starving here. Um, and this is going to be yet another data point for the Japanese who are kind of dithering at this point in late November, early December. Are we going to double down again and try to actually retake this island or what are we going to do? And it's as a result of this attrition over the past couple of weeks and the fact that we just can't keep our troops in supply very shortly now, the Japanese are going to be like, we're done. Yeah. The, the, it's, I mean, I, I'm, <clears throat> I've never quite been sure of the logic behind the uh, Japanese supply drum ideas because they're, they're the least hydrodynamic things you could possibly envisage <laughs> right. and their approach is, we're going to charge at the coast, kick these things over the side where they're almost immediately going to start losing speed, and then right. we're going to bear away and somehow hope they keep going with zero propulsion. <laughs> Which just gives you a sense for how desperate things have gotten here. Um, mm. We often talk about militaries, you know, are, can they adapt or not? And that misses the point of whether or not they can adapt successfully or whether they're thrown back on unsuccessful adaptations and this is a situation where the air power at henderson has just become so lethal that even destroyers are finding it difficult to survive in this threat environment and we have to figure out ways to reduce our time in iron bottom to the absolute minimum so that we can run even further away 
uh, by the time dawn breaks, because when that happens, you know, all manner of badness starts coming down on us. And so, and even, and even at night. So by this time, and, and they were there, you know, previously, by this time, there are PT boats based at Tulagi. Yes. Now, we can sort of, and I think a lot of the, the record supports this, we can sort of laugh at the capabilities of PT boats when compared to a Japanese destroyer, but they're there. They're another right. potential distraction. Uh, it, they do actually end up sinking one, but it, it's, it's uh, there are, uh, to John's point, it is becoming an increasingly hostile threat environment for any Japanese ship or submarine that is entering the sound. And, and so reinforcing their forces there is just becoming untenable. It's, yeah. it's not feasible anymore. Um, the Halsey and the rest of the South Pacific Area Command have have created the circumstances that are going to allow victory to to ensue, um, regardless of you know the outcome of a battle like Tassafaranga. Right. Yeah. yeah that's I, that's a good point. Yeah, and I think it's it's also very important to bear in mind related to that is the fact that you know by any metric as a tactical outcome. Tassafaronga is an absolute disaster for the U.S. Navy. It's you know the, the Japanese have gotten away almost scot free. Okay, they one ship gets very, very, very dead. Very um, so, yeah, um, very dead. Yes, but but you know you you can't in a normal environment go exchanging that many heavily damaged cruisers for a single destroyer. But none of those cruisers were in theater at the start of the Guadalcanal. Can canal campaign or even part way through it um well maybe one um and they'd all been brought in as reinforcements the japanese didn't have many cruisers they could bring in as reinforcements and the u.s was building more and more yeah. cruisers so in some ways that one lost japanese destroyer on a strategic level was actually a much more grievous blow to the japanese because it was a uh, oh, yeah, a well-trained fleet destroyer, something they wouldn't actually build much, if any, of for the rest of the war. Whereas, as apart from the fact that you, know, you know, repaired and put all the um, pretty much everything back into service anyway, even if they lost or written off those ships, they had that many and more still to come on the stocks. Yeah. So, um, it, Although, it, it, I was just going to say, I mean, by the time we get to this point in the campaign, though, both sides cruiser forces are now wrecked. Uh, yeah. Rich Frank makes the makes the point in his book, Wild Canal, that, you know, the 13 American cruisers that have fought uh, in this campaign at this point are either all sunk or damaged and are mm -hmm. out of commission. And from this point on for the next basically year or so, it's going to be destroyer actions uh in the remainder of the solomons with an occasional japanese light cruiser thrown into the mix well from the from the japanese side but not from the yes yeah. So, yeah yeah yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> true mm. that's true yeah yeah because i i feel like tessa franca is the the introduction of a slightly new phase right earlier we were looking at bombardment now it's japanese sort of resupply or evacuation yes. efforts and that goes on so you have tessa Faranga, and then we have Kula Gulf and Kula Mangara, which are similar in the sense that, you know, the Japanese come with destroyers or destroyers led by one of the their light cruisers that is uh, practiced at working with destroyers. Uh, and the U.S. bring a mixed cruiser destroyer task group trying right. to use torpedo attack by the destroyers and gunner gunnery from the cruisers, but not failing, not succeeding in coordinating them well and right. falling victim to uh, extremely you know powerful and well-directed japanese torpedo salvos so it takes until mid 43 now um, august really for you know enough u.s cruisers to be sunk for the u.s navy to say you know what this doesn't make sense to risk cruisers in the solomons quite this way let's let the destroyers loose and that really begins to shift the perspective of these night actions right so, yeah in terms yeah, so, yeah. I was just going to say that uh, in terms of lessons learned, I think what's interesting to me is that by this point in the campaign, it's clear that the U.S. Navy is just doing a much better job of learning, that you don't see um, any real change in the Japanese playbook, at least in terms of how they are employing their destroyers, because their their tactics have generally been 
been fairly uh, efficacious. There, there are some materials. I, I wish I could dig this up now. Um, David Dixon, who was sort of the the dean of Japanese naval doctrine, sent me some tracks. This is probably twenty years ago. Some after action reports uh, were there. You know, by the time you get to this point, the, they are well aware that radar gunnery is a thing. They are very duly impressed by the firepower that particularly our light cruisers can put out. They are emphasizing to their destroyers that you, you've you got to get your torpedoes in the water absolutely as quickly as possible because um, your tactical options are, are becoming narrower and narrower as a result of all of this radar-directed uh, gunnery. But you don't, you, what you don't see is the adoption of radar and then the combat information center on the part of the Japanese and the way that you do see it on the part of the Americans. I think, Trent, your point that that this really becomes a cognitive exercise more than anything else, and how do you make your technology work with that cognitive exercise, that's something that the Japanese never mastered. Um, one of the things I came across during the course of this project is that the Japanese do eventually fit analogs to the CIC in some of their cruisers, but they don't get that um, uh, information room, as they call it. That doesn't get fitted until 1944, by which time, you know, surface combat is sort of an afterthought in, in the broader context of the Pacific campaign. So just the whole culture that the U.S. Navy brought into this thing, which is what, you know, Trent alludes to so wonderfully in, in Learning War, that's really what's starting to, to tilt this thing towards the Americans at this point. We're just learning faster than the Japanese are. Yeah, yeah. And like I said earlier, it's, it's just multiple levels. So there's adaptation in, in the theater. You know, officers are talking to one another, gaining feedback from from fights or, or the cruises that they undertake. And then, you know, the, the type commands are looking at action reports and trying to distill the best lessons from there and promulgating new ideas. And then also at the Pacific Fleet, a more overarching level, that uh, team is assessing lessons as well and, and promulgating them again, like the two tactical bulletins that I mentioned. So coming back to the CIC, that really, I think, is a huge lesson of this, right? We, the U.S. Navy goes into Guadalcanal. Hey, we've got this new technology, radar, it's hot stuff. We'll be able to see at night. Oh, doesn't work this way. Really good for bringing guns on target because it gives us a range. Uh, not so good or not so effective at making sense of what's going on at night. And the reason is uh, because it does, it becomes this cognitive problem. Uh, so the the tactical bulletin explains, you know, every ship is going to create a combat information center. It's going to take in information from all these different sources, lookouts, radar, sonar, if you're equipped with that, et cetera, the radio. And yep. then make sense of it, make sense of it through the use of a team that's going to plot information you know, represented visually so that the evaluator, the officer who is you know, responsible for the CIC and the information it produces can get a, a, a sense of what's going on in the battle. What is happening around the ship? Uh, you know, where are we navigationally and, and what does that mean for, for fighting? And then that officer can provide actionable information to the commanding officer or the formation commander and the ship's weapon systems. Also, so it, it becomes a way to sort of navigate the, the confusion and the complexity of, of, of a night action and keep some from becoming, you know, melees like the, the night of uh, Friday the 13th that we talked about. And it takes some time because this threatens to a certain degree the identity of, of ship commanders, right? Ship commanders are used to, no, I, I, I'm the one who assesses this information. I make sense of it. I decide what to do. Uh, but the officers who respond well to it you know, figure out a way to make their CICs work for them. Uh, and then it, it just transforms the ability of the U.S. Navy once it really starts to take hold, you know, from the middle of 1943 on. It transforms the U.S. Navy's ability to make sense of night combat and to fight effectively. And so they finally are able to introduce distributed formations that can coordinate right. and can work together. Uh, and the Japanese really never get any kind of an equivalent. And uh, yeah. It, you know, from mid forty three on, it's it's a different ball game. Yeah, and I think I think it's it sort of bears in mind as well just what how the industrial advantage that the U.S. has allows them to leverage this, 
right. because you know contrary to some people's opinion the japanese do have radar eventually they as you said they do eventually have a version of a cic they have analogs even if they're not necessarily always quite as good to the us technology but along with not being able to produce that many ships during the war of any particular size they're also not able to produce huge amounts of this technology. So, you know, if the if the US says everybody needs a CIC, there's enough A scopes, PPI scopes, radar, cabling, etc., to actually make sure that every ship is fitted with a CIC. Right. Um and it also means it's stand it's standardized. So, you know, if if the feed to the CIC is, let's say, on its destroyers coming from a Mark 37 fire control director system and range finding system and they're sticking sg radars on everything that will float it means that if you've got an officer in the cic on one destroyer and he's transferred to another he's like oh i know this it's not you know here's artisanal radar unit number one built in right. by mitsubishi but now if you get transferred well 90 percent chance you're not going to see another radar but here's artisanal radar set number two which is completely different and built by completely different people um it was slightly exact as uh the point but it is yeah. that you know that what the japanese face as a problem even when they have a good idea or they try and copy somebody else's ideas by mid-world war ii they just do not have the ability to replicate that across their fleet well i would i would just sort of qualify that by saying mm. early on the u.s fits are variable now the, mm. the radars are more or less standard production but in terms of where the cic is how it's laid out and how it's operated initially these vary a lot and mm. so you know different ships have them in different places i was recently visiting north carolina the preserved battleship mm. for example and it was really fascinating for me to learn i either didn't know this or had long forgotten it that her cic initially was in the plotting room not where it is now it got mm. moved where it is now because Admiral Lee in 1944 insisted that it get moved out of the plotting room and put somewhere else to capitalize on the lessons of other ships. So mm. there was variability in, in terms of how to set these things up and arrange them uh, in, mm. in the U.S. Navy, more so than we might assume today, looking back with the more standardized view that the, you know, the current Na U.S. Navy yeah. has. But they could, but they could do that. <laughs> they had the equipment yes, they could to do it. Do that. So yeah. wherever yeah. you wanted to put CSE, mm -hmm. you could have one. <laughs> you could have one. Yep. Just go to Puget Sound; they'll set it up for you. Right. Yeah. I, I was going to say that there's also there's an analog to this in fleet air defense as well. That the CIC, of course, becomes absolutely crucial to uh, fighter direction on board our carriers, and the same thing happens to the Japanese. They have the raw technology. They have air raid warning sets. They don't seem to have made the conceptual leap to say, okay, how do I utilize the inputs of this technology to then allow me to do effective fighter direction? You don't see that. Even in late war engagements, um, it, it basically radar was a raid warning tool that said, okay, yeah, there's there's something incoming on that vector. Send the fighters over that way and they'll take care of it as opposed wow. to the very active hands-on control that you see on the part mm -hmm. of uh, the U.S. Navy when it comes to actually physically directing and saying, yeah, the target is on this vector at this altitude, and I want you to steer this course and be at this location at this time. You don't mm -hmm. see that in the, in the Japanese fleet. Mm -hmm. And I think it, it shows, like, as Trent was saying, with this, like, the, the, this cognitive loop of problem, solution, re relay, adoption, through the right. fleet they, it's kind of you see it being learned during this campaign but then it's applied in kind of constantly increasing cycles through the rest through the rest of the war um something that i re was recently reading about that highlighted this especially to me was with um in the late war um the japanese managed to finagle um the iff um beacon and system and a lot of the information about radar and the iff systems off of the uss data when it went aground mm. and they figured out very quickly how within you know, the space of a few months how to counter a lot of the advantages that the mark III iff and the radar gave the us and but there's a there's two elements to it one the resource thing you know if if there'd been a if you flipped it around and said oh the japanese have all this wonderful radar and iff and the americans don't if the Americans get hold of the information, they'd be able to exploit it in such a way to get you know a massive attack wave down some identified weakness. Whereas the Japanese have to go, okay, 
we can maybe direct a single bomber because that's what we can like, get our best pilot in a one bomber and we can sneak him in um here and there right. and then you get this whole series of attacks on various carriers which seem to come out of nowhere but very quickly i think the there's this wave of attack it's four i think it's, it's three of the essexes and one of the independences on the 24th of november 1944 and within two or three weeks various people who have been observing this have gone hang on a minute i think <laughs> i know how they've done that and they've implemented i think what they call the tomcat destroyers where they're, they're, they're set, instead of just letting everybody come back with their IFF going, they're going, right, okay, when you come back, you must now fly over this destroyer, and he will verify that you are actually a okay. U.S. aircraft and not a Japanese aircraft pretending to be a U.S. aircraft. Yes. But it's like to, to completely change your IFF and aircraft okay. return to carrier policy on a fleet level when that fleet's on the front line within two or three weeks – Right. That's, that's a massive sort of increase in the reaction. It, it well increase increase in the reaction speed compared right. to what you're seeing at at the beginning of 1942 and even at the start of the Guadalcanal campaign. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So um, yeah, I mean, do do we have any <laughs> anything further to discuss about 42? We've run out of 42. Yeah, <laughs> we've talked no, about the yeah. lessons learned. I, I feel like we've we've actually reached a, a pretty good uh, stopping point, mm -hmm. uh, at least from where I stand. You know, the yep. days of victory are past for the Japanese Navy at this point. So you know, my... <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, it's, it's it's kind of like the naval historian's mantra, isn't it? It's like once it gets beyond gun range, um, the, the land doesn't matter anymore. Right. <laughs> It's right. cognita. <laughs> we don't care about it. Yeah. Um, so uh, I suppose that the last thing to mention, of course, is of course that you know all of this information um, is condensed into uh, several chapters in Fighting in the Dark, um, which of course is available from all good bookshops, but especially over in the states from the USNI. Um, so yes, that's true. Although um, I, I believe there's gonna, there's going to be a British printing, is there not, Trent? That's my understanding. Yes, you usually see fourth pick up a lot of the USNI yes. stuff. So yeah, yep. just looking at a, a lot, of, a lot of my books, like yeah, like yeah, Shipyard at War. Um, actually, ironically, by Ian Johnston, who I met over the weekend. Very nice chap. This one is a USNI, right? Uh, and then he's got Clyde Bank Battle Cruisers, also, which is Sea Fourth. But both okay. of them are sold yeah. by USNI and Seaforth. So I suspect if yeah. there's a UK printing, it'll be Seaforth who do it. I think that's right. That's yeah, our so expectation. You... Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, um, and so you, and you should try to, you know, draw on other authors from the book, you know, especially Vince. Mm -hmm. I'm sure he would love to yeah. come here. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah, definitely. There, there's a lot of different actions to to talk about. I mean, there's uh there's one from the interwar period. Um the Admiral William Fisher, as opposed to Jackie Fisher, mm. um, and his night actions during the Royal Navy exercises in the late 1930s, which I only came across by reading Admiral Cunningham's autobiography, because oh. he was there as commander of the destroyers. And I was fascinated by reading his account, but of course it's a it's a mention of something he was involved in from his perspective. Um, and then Fighting in the Dark goes into it in a lot more detail. So yeah, obviously there'll be links in the video description below where you can get it on you know various online book retailers, USNI, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so definitely pick up a copy, uh, viewers, because <laughs> you will find lots and lots of information. And of course, hopefully, as you said, we'll get some more of the uh, authors on board to talk about their sections because night fighting is a surprisingly complex and uh, yeah. situation. But as we've discussed, but it's also something that happens repeatedly throughout the war. Um, yes. and you know, a lot of what we were talking about here, you know, you look at something like Matapan, which happens before, or you know, the sinking of Haguro that happens much after, or as the couple of battles you mentioned, the, the follow on and the Solomon's campaign in 43, and everything is different. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. I think that's one of the things that's so fascinating about the night fighting in World War II for me is that we look at the surface actions and barring some really weird extremes of weather like Lofferton, um, most of the surface actions are kind of similar in a way. It's like 
both sides see each other. There's a little bit of sizing up who's got the more guns, who's got the more ships. Whoever's got the significant disadvantage tries to run away. The other guys try to pursue them. There's an exchange of gunfire. Maybe something explodes, maybe something doesn't. And uh, outside of real random rolls of the dice, like hood exploding, there's not really a... Right. Yeah, that could basically encapsulate 90% of surface actions during the day. Whereas night actions, it's like, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. throw ships in. Yeah. Maybe something yeah, comes yeah. out at the other end. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. So, well, very uh, good. Yeah. yeah. Ladies thank you and so gentlemen. much for having us. Yes. Yeah. Thank, you. thank you. It's my pleasure once again to see you return to the, the channel. And uh, well, Trent Hone, ladies and gentlemen, and John Parshall. Um, and uh, hopefully we will see you again at some point on the channel, um, if not in person. Uh, I know I've already managed to meet Trent, and uh, at uh, well, and uh, hopefully we get to uh, we get to meet up in September, I believe. Yes, so. exactly. Yeah, yeah. that will yeah. be fun. Yeah. Um, spoiler alert for anyone who runs into Trent: he's not a, he's not the height he appears to be. <laughs> <laughs> he is in fact a giant of a man. <laughs> I'm just tall. Right. <laughs> the other dimensions aren't quite proportionally quite as large. Yeah. That's right. So, right. Okay. Thanks very much, everybody, and uh, see you again in another video. Yeah. Thanks so much. Bye.